Even even in the previous program, you, you, you did keep mentioning the word educator. That's you and I, basically. Mm -hmm. And even here, you say the same thing. Because educators in the end, are responsible. In the end, I mean, for all of the ills of society, we have to say that education is the foundation of curing it. Because most of the ills, the vast majority of the ills, are a product of ignorance. Why would people do something that in fact is really harmful to themselves? Because they're not aware of the harm that is in it to themselves. So it means that the only way to cure these kinds of ills is through education. Education is the cure for ignorance. Right. Now, um, what, what would you say to a teacher who, who would be interested in, in curbing this in their students, regardless of the age of the student? Well, of course, the approach for different ages is going to vary. It's going to differ. Because how you approach, you know, a six-year-old primary student and how you approach a grade 12 or grade 10 student has to be different. Their mental levels are different. So uh, if you're dealing with the, the bigger uh, grades, the, the, the elder children then, uh, or youths, then you have to give more explanations. You know, and, and uh, they have to clearly understand what is behind all of this. I have a focus question for you on that one when we come back. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back with you very soon. Thank you. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Witness with Wahid. And this is a special evening where we have Dr. Bilal Phillips with us. And for those of you who are just joining us, let me just tell you that some of the questions that I asked my brother, Bilal Phillips, would be sometimes controversial. We'll try and avoid that, but then all in the purpose of enlightenment. Earlier on in the program, we called ourselves responsible educators. And as responsible educators, we seriously need to address these issues, like horoscopes and, and, and the occult world and so on, almost at the national level. Would, would you say that? Would I would say absolutely. I mean, be, this has to be addressed within the educational curriculum itself. You know, it has to be all of the ills, really, of society. I mean, it's just like the khutbah of Juma, or Friday uh, sermon. Mm -hmm. It should address the problems that the society is facing on a day-to-day -day basis. Similarly, the overall problems which are continuing problems for all civilizations, all countries, etc. These issues have to be resolved uh, for the students that are growing up, for the next generation. They have to see some solutions. They must have in their minds some clarity as to how to deal with this, these problems when they take over. Because we're preparing a new generation who, who are to take over for, from us you know, the uh, forward momentum of our community. Right, let's take a look at the average student. On the one side, he's got to sit there and he's got to listen to some people telling him about the black magic, about the voodoo, about the Ouija boards. On the other side, he's got the newspaper with the, with the Geminis and the Virgos on them. And then, compounding the, the era of life, would be where he's sitting there trying to do his homework at night and then he gets to hear this little bump in the dark. How, how would you address this? I mean, he's obviously scared of something that's not there. So at what level would you say would be the cut-off point of, of what is right and what's wrong? Where would he need his awareness to be retuned into the Islamic way of thinking? Would it be right at the black magic level or even like the little bump in the dark? Things that go bump in the dark. Should he be scared? Well, that depends on how his parents have raised him. You know, if they've raised him using, you know, uh, terminology which increases fear of the dark, you know, if you do so and so, the boogeyman will come out and get you. That's the word, boogeyman, yes. <laughs> you know, so if that is the way you've raised the child, then obviously this is going to be a problem in his later years. This fears will always be there. So we shouldn't, this is not a part of our educational system. You know, we have uh, a sound educational methods from an Islamic perspective in raising children and dealing with you know errant behavior it's not to create false images and thoughts as we reject Christmas and Santa Claus 
We also reject, on the other hand, the boogeyman and the other uh, imaginary uh, figures from the dark world, you know, which, we can, which people use to scare others. So we have to be uh, clear from both sides of the spectrum and be on that middle and clear path, educating uh, people to reality, our children growing with a good understanding of what life really is about and uh, clear that any form of fortune telling is something despised by God, it is, it is evil, it is against the Islamic teachings and we should put our trust ultimately in God. The future no one knows, only Allah knows. No matter what people tell us, no matter what we hear from those who have predicted the future, whatever successes they may appear to have, know that they've got many more failures than successes. But people tend to focus just on the success. Is there anything that, anything within Islam that would be almost parallel to any kind of fortune telling? Or what, foretelling of the future? What we have, there's nothing really parallel. What we have is, is the is a means by which a person can put his trust in God in dealing with the future. And that is called uh, Salat al-Istikhara, okay. you know, or Dua al-Istikhara, where the Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, had taught that when a person has an affair for his or her future, they have a decision to make, mm -hmm. that they should make two units of prayer. Mm -hmm. After having decided which route they're going to take because it's not just people come and they think you just you have two choices and you're going to make this prayer with your two choices you're not sure which one you should do no what you do is you use whatever means you have to get clarity as to which is the better of the two after you've concluded that this in fact is the better of the two then you make your two units of prayer you turn to God saying you know oh Allah I know you know the future and you have the power in all these affairs. If this decision that I've made is in fact good for me, then bless me with it, make it easy for me. But if it's not good for me, then take it away from me and make me aware, you know, remove from my heart the desire for it and guide me to what is better. So, we're in, our, in other words, after we have made the effort, this is the tying of the camel, Right? After we've made the effort, then we put our trust in God. And isn't that simple? Yes. And there is no such thing as an Islamic horoscope. No such thing. Unfortunately, people have turned istikhara into that. <laughs> you know, they will go to somebody else, to Sheikh so and so, can you make istikhara for me? No, no, nobody can make istikhara for you. I mean, my parents made istikhara for me. No, no, your parents can't make istikhara for you. You have to make istikhara for yourself. And it is you turning your fears over to God. It is not you going and finding out for others. Because some people say, for example, you know, if after you've made istikhara, you should do it before going to sleep at night. And then if you see a red light, it means don't. If you see a green light, it means go ahead. And this is all nonsense. There's no issue about sleeping and finding out the answers to it in your dreams. Reality is just that you have made your decision, which is a reasoned decision, not just an emotion decision. You've called on those around you, you've gotten the information, and you go ahead. Now if you find difficulty, you see, the thing that you plan to do, you find all kinds of roadblocks coming in your way, blocking you. And this is the science to tell you this was not the better way. What do you say about people who wear?